Okay. All right. So as I was saying, the course outline basically tries to the course basically tries to uh, provide an understanding of uh, auditing in a computerized uh, environment. And to do that, there are quite a number of uh, topics we would uh, go through to try and create that linkage between core auditing principles and core information system operation or activities. And to do that, we'll be relying on uh, the book by Inga and uh, Ahmed, Understanding uh, and conducting information systems auditing. Okay. Perfect. So then in the first part, we'll try to create an understanding of what information systems audit is, and then who should be auditing an information system. So we'll try to find out in the Ghanaian context, is there a legal requirement of who an information systems auditor should be as compared to the legal requirement for who should be an accountant? Then we also look at the systems environment and uh, its relationship with information systems audit. Then we'll try to understand some basic uh, terminologies in terms of what information system assets are and how this information system assets can be protected by instituting some controls at either the general level or at the application level. And then we'll look at the impact of computers on information then the impact of computers on auditing. Basically, these two things try to create a nexus between computers and uh, auditing. And then we'll look at information systems audit, the coverage of this particular, this whole course. Okay. The second part looks at hardware. The second part looks at hardware security issues. So here we'll be interested in hardware security, peripheral devices, storage media, and all, all these things are things we have done previously. So hardware security and then the third part is software security issues issues of uh, licensing issues of uh, maybe bugs in the software and all that and how it can be addressed then the fourth part which is so you see that the third the second and the third part uh hasn't got anything much to do with auditing in terms of a, 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 a link it basically creates a foundation for us to be able to understand that if there are hardware is security issues, there are software is security issues, they could serve as loopholes or, or backdoors through which people would be able to override controls in an organization and thereby commit fraud or do something else. So it is important that okay. we understand hardware and security issues. Then the fourth lecture will look at uh, information systems audit requirements. Here, we'll be interested in understanding what we mean by risk analysis. Then we'll also try to create an understanding of some key concepts like threats, vulnerability, exposure, and attacks. And then we'll look at, we'll also try to understand what we mean by control, specifically internal control. And if we are introducing controls in an information systems or environment, what would be the objectives of the control? And if you want to also conduct an information system audit, what will be the objectives of the information systems audit? And we'll try to also look at how information systems can be effective and efficient. We'll look at information systems abuse, how we can safeguard it, and how we can collect evidence with regards to activities in an information system. And this is where we'll also look at the issue of uh, locks and the audit trails the trails of activity in an information system. Then the fourth, the fifth part looks at conducting an information systems audit. That's the actual activity. How do you go about conducting an audit? Then we'll look at the audit program, the audit plan, the audit procedure one, one needs to follow and the approaches and the kind of the different kinds of tests. One will look at the two main kinds of tests. will be looked at here, compliance tests, substantive tests will be looked at. Then we'll also look at some audit tools. And also we'll be uh, wary of the fact that if one is going to conduct an audit, it is not everything in the information system that the auditor will be able to have access to, will have the time to be able to go through. So the auditor will need to what? We need to sample. And to sample, the auditor will need some sampling technique, need to understand some sampling technique so that the sampler will provide, uh, 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 will we'll provide us the basis to generalize our findings in relation to the sample to the bigger information system or population. 
And then we also look at audit questionnaires. Sometimes there are some questions uh, auditors will prepare and then a pre-designed list of questions they would want to administer or ask those who have been using or conducting information system activities. Then we we'll look at audit documentation. If we are conducting an audit, how do we record the auditor's activity? And usually the auditor will have what we call the working paper, the working paper. The auditor will use a working paper to record different activities. Sometimes auditors may also use flow charts to be able to map up the flow of activities in a particular uh, scenario. Then finally, how the audit report is prepared, okay? Then the, la the last but not the least, we'll also have look at risk-based systems audits. And then finally, we'll look at business continuity and disaster recovery plan. Business continuity and disaster recovery plan is also something you, would, you guys would look at in IS resilience with MIFTA. You look at something like that. So basically, this is what the course is about. Yeah, and the text we will be relying on is this. Let me show you. This is the text so we'll be relying on. Yeah, this is the text we'll be relying on. Understanding and conducting information systems auditing. And I'll share that one with you at the end of the lecture. All right, now let's try to look at the first lecture. share my screen. Oh, what's happening? It's a minute. Yeah, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. I can see. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, brilliant. Uh, were you able to get Jamal? Yeah, I think he's online. Yeah. yeah, Jamal is on now. Okay, all right. Yes, so today's uh, the first lecture actually tries to look at uh, provide an overview. It provides an overview of information systems audit. And our main focus in this lecture will be able to try and understand, uh, to understand the features of a computerized system that an information system auditor needs to know. Then why uh, an information system audit should be conducted. Then we'll look at the challenges that an auditor faces while auditing a computerized environment. Then we'll look at the difference between a computerized and non-computerized system. We just think this we know already. Okay. Yes. So when we say an information systems audit, basically what we mean is that we would be interested in uh, examining the different kinds of controls within the information systems uh, environment, the different kinds of controls. And when we say controls, controls are laid down procedures or guidelines that will guide the use, the access to some resources within an information system environment. So typically in a traditional auditing environment, if there is a rule that you cannot take cash uh, to the bank alone, you would have to be accompanied by either a police officer or something. In that case, that is a control feature, a control to make sure that the cash is safe when you take it to the bank. Similarly, if we are looking at an information systems environment, if we have a rule in an information system environment that you cannot log onto a computer without a username or into the organization system, information system without a username and a password. In that case, that will also be what? A control. And that control, this control in the information system environment will be referred to as an access control. So information systems audit basically tries to examine the various kinds of controls which may be instituted in an information systems environment, all the different kinds. Okay. And it also involves collect the collection and evaluation of evidence of the design and functions of the controls. How were the controls designed? 
sometimes controls can be designed intentionally to favor somebody. Maybe it is designed to favor the accountant so that the accountant will always have his way. So when the information system auditor comes, he is supposed to examine the controls to, to, to find out the effectiveness and efficiency of the controls, okay? So when the auditor actually evaluates the controls, the auditor will form an opinion on whether the, the, the auditor will form an opinion on whether the information resources in the organization were properly safeguarded. And then he will also ensure, he will also form an opinion on whether the information or, or whether the data that is uh, in the organization's information system is reliable and properly recorded, whether there's data integrity and whether all the controls that are in the information systems environment operate effectively and very well. So the information systems auditor would basically form an opinion. We have to be wary of the fact that there is always a confusion out there that an auditor is supposed to come to an organization to find the errors, whether people have stolen money or not. That's not the work of the auditor. The work of the auditor is to find, is to find, is to examine, evaluate the organization's records in this context, the information systems in the organization, and then form an opinion on whether the information system actually represents or presents a true and fair view of the activities that are being conducted in the organization. So the, the information systems auditor would want to ensure that the information assets are properly safeguarded, there's data integrity, everything is operating effectively and efficiently in achieving organizational objectives. So basically that is the role of the information systems uh, the, the, the meaning or understanding around information system audit. Now, an information systems audit can be performed independently. When we say independently, independently, we mean that the traditional audit in the organization is to form an opinion on the financial statements. In conducting the audit of the financial statements, an IS audit can be conducted alongside it or an IS audit can be conducted independent of the financial statements, okay? Then usually uh, IS audits is conducted as an independent function, function in order to test the controls that exist within the information system environment. Now, let's look at the legal requirement of an information systems audit. In Ghana, there's a legal requirement that every registered entity should uh, have proper books of accounts. And these proper books of accounts should be uh, examined by an independent auditor, especially uh, companies. It should be examined by an independent auditor. Because uh, information systems audits are a current phenomena in our context, I'm not sure if there's any legal requirement backing the information system audit of organization, but there's a legal requirement back in the audit of financial statement of all, or of all registered entities. So most often than not, an information system audit is a best practice and not necessarily a legal issue. Sometimes it is also considered as an ethical exercise rather than a legal requirement that is being instituted. Now, who can be an information systems auditor? Any person having a recognized qualification in information system audit can conduct an information systems audit. But generally, you may need to be certified before you can be called an information systems auditor. And to be certified, you must have registered with the certified information uh, system auditor uh, association, the, the information systems audit and control association. Write the exams for the certification or being the information systems auditor, so that you will have to hold the sister qualification by ISACA to be able to practice as a certified information systems auditor. And for uh, you guys, all the things we have done are aligned with the CISA program, all the courses we are doing. 
So it is hopeful that even at the end of the MBA program, if you want to be a certified information systems auditor, I would encourage that you register the exam. Don't go for any training, any workshop, and you will be able to pass it. This exam is a multiple choice exam, and you become a certified information systems auditor. In actual fact, as part of the controller, uh, the audit service, the same requirement they use to recruit chartered accountants is the same thing. If you have a certified information system auditor, you could also enter the Ghana audit, uh, audit service. Okay. Now I want us to look at the systems environment and the information systems audit because there's a linkage between the two because the systems environment environment is actually the context within which the information systems audit is being conducted. So it is important that we try to see the linkage between the two. Now, to ensure that uh, we perform computerized tasks or to ensure that computerized tasks take care of existing and emerging needs of the organization, we need to consider a number of issues. We need to consider a number of issues to ensure that computerized computerization takes care of existing and emerging needs of the organization. We need to consider this. The standardization of hardware, operating systems, system software, and applications. It is important that in the systems environment to ensure a fluent information systems audit. It is important that hardware, operating system, everything is standardized. For a typical example, if you were to have legacy systems in an organization where the accounts office is using a different kind of old software, then the the payroll section is also using some different kind of an old software. The softwares are not integrated. There will be some kind of a problem. So this standardization is necessary to ensure fluency. Then the use of software to facilitate interconnectivity of systems. This one ties into the hardware, the hardware issues. Use of software to facilitate interconnectivity of systems intensifies the need for systems audit to ensure that information flow is smooth and not compromised. If everything is properly integrated, that means that whatever happens here will be reflected in other departments. It will be difficult for people to cut corners and do things. There's also the need for high levels of security that should be maintained. Also, communication and uh, networking, networking involving the use of network would facilitate the establishment of a central database that can be uh, centrally managed. But the fact that we have a centralized database doesn't mean that we cannot have what a distributed processing from individual departments, but we can have a centralized data warehouse where everything is uh, kept. Then there needs to be a, a technology infrastructure with periodic upgrades so that uh, we can always ensure that our systems are, are up to date. Okay. Then the need for business process engineering. Yeah, every day the, the activities in an organization will change. And if the activities change, we also have to re-engineer to ensure that our systems are able to deal with the new activities that emerge. Okay, now I used this word earlier, information system assets. And we indicated that the main objective of the information system audit is for the auditor to form an opinion on whether the information system assets are what properly safeguarded. Now the question is, what is an information system asset? Uh, information systems asset can be categorized into different into different groups. So let's try and see. Information system assets may be segregated into various kinds, such as so we have. Uh, remember, we are looking at information system assets. As part of information system assets, we can have what we call information assets. And information assets would include databases, data files, system documentation, operating manuals, help files, training guides, and all whatnot. That would be information assets. Then we also have what is called the software assets. And this would include the operating system, application software system, uh, system software, development tools and whatnot. Apart from that, we also have the physical assets, which will be the physical monitors, the physical uh, processes, laptop, physical components of it, uh, storage media, hard drives, 
and whatnot. That would be the fiscal assets. Apart from that, we also have an intangible information asset called the services. And these services would include the computing environment services, inter-office and intra-office communication services. Inter-office inter -office communication would be communication within, communication services within different departments. Then we can also have intra-office communication. And intra-office communication will be communication within the, the department. That, is, that will be between colleagues within the same uh, department. This is the main categories of information system assets for the services, the fiscal assets, software assets, and then what? Information assets, okay? Then we have, uh, now we need to understand what we mean by control. And I think I gave a brief and a brief understanding. I tried to provide a brief understanding of what controls are, the procedures, the policies that are instituted to ensure that assets, information resources are properly safeguarded in the organization. Now controls are central to the idea of information systems audit because without controls, the information systems audit will not be, would, would, would have difficulty in examining the effectiveness and efficiency of what is going on. So the internal, the controls actually define a point of action in a work process. You know, it, it defines the point of action in a work process, okay? So controls are usually, controls without an alternative are fictitious controls that exist only on paper. So controls always come with uh, some alternatives. If we don't, if, if, if we want to safeguard this asset, we can either do this or that. Now, how do we uh, classify controls, these procedures and guidelines, which will safeguard our information assets? They can be classified in three basic categories. We have general controls, application controls, and objective-based controls. Three, general controls, application controls, and objective-based controls. Now, when we say general controls, what do we mean? General controls are the basic issues that any information system should observe, basic. So all information systems should be able to observe this. And the general controls are applicable across all the systems that exist in the organization. It's, it, it, it cuts across all departments. General controls features in most systems can be classified into different categories. So for instance, we may have what we call organization and operation controls. And these controls deal with uh, the segregation of duties. Organization operation controls ensure that power is not vested in one person. So power can be divided. Um, otherwise, if power is vested in one person, assuming the accountant is the one who, who issues, uh, who, who, who makes orders, he does the procurement, he pays, everything is done by him. It means that there is no segregation of function or segregation of duty. The accountant can easily override the controls and do a lot of things without recourse to anybody, okay? So that's just one organization and operation controls. Then we also have, and still under general controls, we also have what we call system development and documentation controls. And the system development and documentation controls will involve the process, the processes, how we can review the processes in terms of the development of an information system, how we can test and make sure that new systems that are coming into, or if we are modifying our systems, these systems are properly tested before they come in. So we have to ensure that, so that our procurement officers don't just go and, and procure a system and just come and put it in the organization where it cannot uh, deal with the reality on the ground, okay? So system development and documentation controls. So it also has to deal with the control over the programs and changes to the programs. Now programs or softwares usually come with documentation procedures. It comes with documentation procedures. So if we are instituting, we are implementing a system and organization, it's not everybody who must have the same access rights. So the access rights should also be what? Segregated based on rank or some other criteria. All this would be part of the system development and documentation controls. 
Then we also have what we call hardware and software and system software controls, which would include how we detect errors in our software, automatic error detection features, periodic preventive maintenance. Maybe once in a while, we need to conduct some physical maintenance of our hardware or do some kind of uh, system uh, scanning to make sure that if there are some bugs in our system, these things are, are dealt with. That comes under hardware and system software controls. So if in case the, the, the maybe some of our hardware has some problems or software has some problem, it is under these controls that we can go through formal procedures to recover the hardware from the errors that may have uh, occurred. Then we also have access controls, access controls. And the access controls consist of preventing and authorize or authorize people from having access to the required information, information systems, okay? So four types. Then the last, the, that's four so far. Then the fifth one, the fifth one is data and procedure controls. Uh, data and procedure controls, which would consist of a control or a balancing function in, with respect to manuals in support of system procedures, okay? Then the last one would be business continuity, uh, continuity controls. Okay, I'm using a, a, a free Zoom account, so I will log, it will automatically log me out every 40 minutes. <laughs> so I'm left with some four minutes. All right, but I want to finish this aspect. So we said two, we said three types of control, three main types of controls, general controls, application controls will be the next kind of control. And application controls provide a detailed structure of applications of how uh, things are specific applications are dealt with within the organization, okay? And they can also be classified. So there are three types of application controls, which are input controls, and the input controls will involve transaction entry, who has a right to enter a transaction, who has a right to for file maintenance transactions, inquiry and different kinds. So input, whatever is going to be inputted into the organization system, there must be some control as to who must be in charge, who should do it at what time, and all those things should be clearly spelled out. Then we also have processing controls, which are usually included in application programs and designed to prevent or detect errors of the following nature, failure to process all input transactions or erroneous processing. So that if somebody is trying to input, to override uh, an input control, and then it will input a wrong figure, the processing control should be able to do what? Should be able to detect it. If somebody has already inputted a figure, say 10 CDs, and once in with respect to A, and is inputting the same figure again, the processing control should be able to detect that this is what? A duplication, okay then there are many and then the other one is output controls which are used to assure or ensure the accuracy of the processing results the results that are printed if it's a physical printing that's going to be done somebody needs to actually verify that what is printed is actually what is uh, captured in the system's internal internal environment that is where we may come across terms like balancing visual visual scanning uh, verification before the the, doc, the output is what distributed to other departments. Okay. Then the last kind of control is the objective based control controls. Then objective based controls consists of a number of other controls, which include what we refer to directive controls. And these controls comprise management actions, procedures, and uh, yeah, management actions, procedures, directives, or guidelines that facilitate the occurrence of a preferred event. So directive controls are usually executed by top level management who instruct lower level staff to do A, B, C, D. Then we have what we call preventive controls. And preventive controls aim to establish a reliable system and ensure that certain errors do not, do not occur. So we also have what we call detective controls and then corrective controls. So they are, they are directive controls, preventive controls, detective controls, corrective controls, and then recovery controls. If there's a problem and our data is lost, 
what should we ensure, what should we do to ensure that we can easily recover the data. And we can easily ensure this by relying on, these days, many organizations uh, institute recovery controls by signing up to cloud activities or cloud uh, services, okay? Then the last part looks at uh, the impact of computers on information. And this is some, something you guys will easily do, which I'm not going to spend much time to try and explain that. Consists of transaction initiation, inputs, and whatnot, okay? Yeah. Any, any question? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so, we are, so we are, we are okay. Thank you. Okay. So, so you would see that it is basically just IS, but we want, we fuse it with what? Auditing technologies to be able to see how we can ensure efficiency and the uh, and control in an auditing environment. Hello, how, so how, how do we sign? <laughs> you are you are around. <laughs> you, may, you, may, uh, you may have to see a uh, spy and just get the sheet and and sign for all the other weeks. That's what you do. That's how we're going to do it. I, I don't I don't know know the system will lock me out, so I'll lock back in. 